Hi, welcome back to Engineers Escape. My name's Jake, and today we're on part two of our Build a Camera Drone series, How It Flies, Flight Mechanics and Components of a Quadcopter Unmanned Aerial System. Let's go. If you haven't already, make sure you check out part one, the introduction and overview, and also be on the lookout for part three, where we're gonna be ordering the components. Before we start building our quadcopter, it's a good idea to have some basic understanding of how they work. So let's go over to the whiteboard and get started. So what is a drone? A drone could also be called a UAV, which stands for Unmanned Aerial Vehicle, an aircraft piloted by remote control or onboard computers. So we know what a UAV is. What is a UAS? UAS stands for Unmanned Aerial System, so basically it includes the drone and everything else, like the radio and the goggles. What's a rotor? A rotor is a generic term for something that spins or rotates. In our case, they will be the propellers that will create thrust and lift. So what's a quadcopter? A quad, quadcopter, quad rotor is a specific case of a multi-rotor that has four propellers. Thrust, lift, and torque. Thrust. Thrust is a pushing force and can be acting in any direction. Lift is a force that directly opposes the weight of the aircraft. So gravity will try and bring it down, the force of weight, and lift will keep it up in the air. Torque is a twisting force that tends to cause rotation. And I think people might not have as good of an understanding of torque as they do these other two. So let's talk about that a little bit more. Newton's third law says that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. An example of this would be holding an eraser. For every action, the weight of the eraser pushing down on my hand, there is an equal and opposite reaction, my hand pushing up on the eraser. And this keeps it still. Newton's third law also works for torques. In this example, we have a top-down view of a helicopter. Have you ever thought about why a helicopter has a tail rotor? In this example, the propellers are spinning this way. That is, the body is applying a rotational force on the propellers this way. So according to Newton's third law, the propellers will also be rotating the body the opposite direction. So the body is going to want to try to rotate this way. This is why we have the tail rotor. The tail rotor will apply a force to the body of the helicopter to prevent it from spinning. This concept of torques and balancing is going to be important in understanding how the quadcopter works. Thrust, lift, and torque are all generated by spinning rotors. More RPMs create more thrust and torque for each rotor. For simplicity, we are going to be ignoring drag. We're going to assume that the center of gravity, CG, is centered on the craft, and we're going to assume that the quad is not moving at the start of all maneuvers, or the velocity equals zero. This is our Quad X setup. So here are our four motors. You'll notice they're numbered one, two, three, and four. Also notice that the red arrow in the middle is facing towards the front of the quad. You'll also see the directions that the propellers are spinning. So motors number four and number one spin clockwise, and motors number two and number three spin counterclockwise. Also note that the radio we're using is going to be a mode two radio. The first move we'll talk about is hovering. Hovering means it's staying in the same place in the air, and we're going to assume that at a 50% throttle that our craft will be hovering. The amount of RPMs that each of the propellers is getting is going to be denoted by the fraction of the circle that's filled in with green. Each of the four motors are at 50% RPM. The important thing about hovering is that the total lift generated by all four propellers is equal to the amount of weight of the copter. The quadcopter will also not be rotating in any direction because the two clockwise motors are going the same speed as the two counterclockwise motors, canceling out the torques. To ascend, you'll increase the throttle to all four motors equally. This will make the lift greater than the weight, 
and the craft will rise into the air. To descend, you'll do the opposite. Pitch means when the copter tilts forward or backwards. In this example, we're going to have the copter pitching forwards. So if we look over here at our diagram, the front two motors have spun down and the back two motors have spun up. Since the two back motors have a greater lift than the front, this will cause the craft to tilt forwards. Again, the torques in this example also equal out, so we will have no yawing. Since the quad is now tipped forward, some of the lift will be changed into forward thrust and propel the quad forward. In order to pitch the craft forward, use the right stick and push it upwards. To pitch back, use the right stick and push backwards. Roll means to tilt the copter left or right. In this example, we're going to be showing left roll. You can see here that the left two motors have spun down and the right two motors have spun up. The right two motors will be creating more lift than the left two motors. This will cause the quad to roll left. And again, the torques cancel out. Now that the quad has rolled left, some of the lift will be changed into thrust and cause the quad to travel to the left. In order to roll, we're going to be using the right stick. You push that left to roll left or right to roll right. Yaw means to change the direction that the front of the craft is facing. So you could yaw left or yaw right. In this example, we're going to be yawing to the left. The two counterclockwise motors are spinning slower than the clockwise motors. This creates an imbalance in torque. And if you remember from Newton's third law, if these ones have more torque and they're spinning this way, then that means the body is going to want to try to rotate the opposite way. And this will cause the body to yaw to the left. To yaw to the left, push the left stick to the left. To yaw right, push the left stick to the right. Now let's look at the drone components in the unmanned aerial system. The flight controller is the brain of the drone. It keeps it in the air and also talks to other components. The radio transmitter, or the remote control, will send our commands from here <coughs> over to our receiver, abbreviated as RX, and that will tell, the receiver will tell the flight controller what we want to do. The electronic speed controller, or ESC, takes the signal from the flight controller and tells the motor how fast to spin. There are four ESCs and motors on a quadcopter, but for simplicity, I'm only drawing one. The GPS usually also has a compass module. This sends location data to the flight controller and also heading data. The first person view camera will take video from the quadcopter in real time and send it to the flight controller, which has a built-in on-screen display. What the on-screen display does is it takes flight data and overlays it on the video so we can read it in real time. It takes this video with the overlaid information and sends it to the video transmitter, which transmits it through the air, which is received by our VRX, or video receiver, also known as goggles, so that we can monitor it. You can also have a DVR or digital video recorder if you want to save that real-time footage. The battery supplies the flight controller and other components with power. This little guy right here is the capacitor. The capacitor cleans up dirty power signals to prevent interference. This flight controller doubles as a power distribution board, or PDB. And what that means is that instead of having to solder all the components power to one pad, there's pads throughout the flight controller to make it easier to solder. What it also does is it takes the battery voltage, say 11.4 volts, and we'll reduce it down to different voltages for these smaller components, such as 5 volts and maybe 3.3 volts. When the battery needs recharged, we'll put it on the charger. The charger also has another task, which is putting batteries in storage mode, and we'll talk about that more later. On our drone, we're also going to have an HD camera and a gimbal. The gimbal stabilizes the HD camera footage, and the HD camera, of course, is the video we're going to be showing everyone that looks nice. We can also control the gimbal by hooking it up to the receiver. 
we now have a basic understanding of some of the components. So let's talk about some of the sensors that help the quad fly. The first sensor is the IMU, or Inertial Measurement Unit. This actually has two different sensors. One is the accelerometer, which measures the force exerted on the quad, the linear force. The next is the gyroscope, which measures the rotational motion of the quad. These two sensors only measure the linear and rotational forces on the quad. In other words, it doesn't currently know where it's at, and it also doesn't know where it's currently rotated. It doesn't know if it's straight up and down or upside down with those sensors. Barometer is the next sensor. A bar is a unit of atmospheric pressure, so this measures atmospheric pressure. Since atmospheric pressure decreases with an increase in altitude, the barometer is actually used to tell us the altitude of our quadcopter. The voltmeter is used to measure the battery voltage. The current sensor measures the current. Power equals current times voltage, or if you want to think of it in terms of units, watts equal one amp times one volt. If you keep track of the power used over time, you can also display watt hours, which will tell you how much energy has been used from the battery, or milliamp hours, which will tell you how much charge has been used from the battery. The compass, or the magnetometer, works by sensing Earth's weak magnetic field, and that will tell us the heading of the drone in other words, if it's facing north, east, south, or west. GNSS stands for Global Navigation Satellite System. This includes GPS from the United States and also GLONASS from Russia. And there's also some other smaller ones like Galileo. People usually call the GNSS just GPS because that's the one that's typically included. And ours will have receivers for both GPS and GLONASS. Based upon the position of multiple satellites in the sky, we can determine our position, speed, and to a lesser extent, our altitude. All right, guys, well, I hope you found that video helpful. If you did, I'd appreciate it if you left a like, and if you'd like to see more videos like this, be sure to subscribe. Also, if you haven't already, be sure to check out part one, the intro and overview, and be on the lookout for part three, where we're going to be ordering the components. Thanks for watching.